I've looked at what happened during the universe's first second, and blimey, it was busy. Now I want to have a look at another slice of the history of our universe. So in this video, I'm going to look at what happened from one second to about 370,000 years. Let's find out more. 370,000 years isn't just some random number that I've picked out of the air. There's a very important reason for selecting that time, but we'll get to that later. Firstly, we'll start off at time equals one second, and we've just left the Hadron Epoch. The very end of the Hadron Epoch saw an important event occurring. That is the decoupling of neutrinos. Before this time, neutrinos interacted with the matter that existed in the universe. But at a time of one second, neutrinos stopped interacting with matter. Since the neutrinos at this time no longer interacted, they just started flying around the universe, and have been flying around the universe ever since. Somewhere out there, these neutrinos still exist and form what's called the neutrino background radiation. But these neutrinos are very low energy much lower in energy than neutrinos made today in the heart of suns. These neutrinos are out there, but due to their low energy, we may never discover them. This is important, and I'll get back to this idea later. So, at a time of one second, we enter the lepton epoch. Temperatures have decreased, so heavier particles like quarks are no longer being produced. However, the energy levels are still high enough for the production of leptons. And this includes electron and positron pairs. When they collide and annihilate each other, gamma rays are produced. Since gamma rays are part of the electromagnetic spectrum, what's actually being produced here are high energy photons. This reaction also works the other way around, with energetic photons producing electron positron pairs. Since the hadrons are no longer being produced and most have annihilated each other, but the leptons are still being produced, the majority of the mass of the universe is now made up of leptons. But how can matter be created out of seemingly nothing? Well, it's all to do with energy and Einstein's famous equation. According to that, energy and matter are just two sides of the same coin. Mass can be turned into energy, and obviously the opposite can happen. Energy can be turned into mass. However, huge amounts of energy are needed to form even tiny amounts of mass, but in the early universe, energy levels are immense, and so matter can easily be made. If two photons have high enough energy, when they collide, matter can be produced, in this case an electron and a positron. In fact, we've now done this in the lab. Well, Atom Smasher. At the relativistic heavy ion collider, Gold ions were accelerated in opposite directions to nearly the speed of light. This caused the production of photons that circulated with the gold ions. The streams of gold were then brought close to each other so that they didn't quite collide, but the photons around them did. And this did indeed produce electron and positron pairs as was predicted. Again, there seems to be a slight disparity between the number of leptons and antileptons produced by this mechanism, and there's a small number of leptons left over after this annihilation. These excess electrons are what go on to combine with the nuclei and produce the atoms of the universe later on. The lepton epoch lasts for about 9 seconds from a time of 1 second to about 10 seconds after the start of the universe. At the end of the lepton epoch, we now enter the photon epoch. This will last all the way out to about 370,000 years, but there are a number of things that are happening that split this epoch into a number of subsections. The energies are now too low for lepton antilepton pairs to be produced, but they're too high for electrons to interact with hadrons forming atoms. These particles are interacting with photons meaning that the universe is opaque and it's a hot, dense fog through which light doesn't travel very easily. During all this time and beyond, the universe is still expanding, and as the universe expands, the energies decrease. The energies keep decreasing, and it's this change in energies that triggers the events that happen. Once the energies become low enough for something to happen, it'll happen. 
So at the start of the Photon Epoch, 10 seconds after the start of the universe, we have hadrons formed from quarks and they're left over from the antimatter matter annihilation. We also have the leptons that are left over from their matter antimatter annihilation. We also have very high energy photons. And now the majority of the mass slash energy making up the universe comes from these photons. For what happens next, I've looked at a number of sources that don't completely agree on the absolute timings. I'm going to go with some numbers, but please be aware that these numbers might be a little fluid. After about two minutes, the energy is dropped sufficiently for nuclear fusion to occur. The protons smash into each other, firstly to form deuterium nuclei. However, for the first minute of this deuterium formation, the photons have got sufficient energy to smash the deuterium nuclei apart. After about a minute though, the energy of the universe decreases further, and the photons no longer have enough energy to smash apart the deuterium nuclei, so nuclear synthesis starts in earnest. In a multi-stage process called the proton-proton chain reaction, protons will fuse and protons will fuse with neutrons to eventually form helium nuclei. This is the same type of fusion that occurs in the heart of our sun. This process only lasts up to about 20 minutes after the start of the universe. After this time, temperatures drop below those required for nuclei to fuse. At the end of this nucleosynthesis phase of the universe, about 75% of the nuclei are hydrogen and nearly 25% are helium-4. There are trace amounts of other elements such as deuterium and lithium and beryllium but the vast majority are hydrogen and helium. The majority of hydrogen and helium that the universe will ever have is made here. Well, the nuclei are at least. And at the end of this period of time, the observable universe is about 600 light years in diameter. And now we wait. Temperatures are too low for nuclear fusion to produce any new atomic nuclei, but the temperatures are still too high for the electrons to associate with the nuclei, forming actual atoms. During this time, the universe is still opaque to light, and we have to wait for quite some time for anything to happen of any note. The universe keeps on expanding, and as it does, the temperature keeps on dropping. Sometime between 45 and 70,000 years after the start of the universe, it's cooled down even more. Up until this point, the energy density of the radiation in the universe has been higher than the energy density of the matter. And this radiation has controlled the expansion of the universe. At this point, however, the energy density of the radiation fell below that of the matter. And from now on, the energy density of the matter will dominate the universe. And this had the effect of slowing down the expansion of the universe. Sometime between 370 and 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the temperature had dropped sufficiently for the electrons whizzing around the universe to start to combine with the atomic nuclei. This event was very significant because up until this point, the photons had been interacting with the atomic nuclei, making the universe opaque. However, at this point, the photons stop interacting and the universe for the first time becomes transparent. These photons remained flying around the universe, and those photons are still around today and make up what we know as the cosmic microwave background radiation. This then is known as the surface of last scattering. Even if we had powerful telescopes, powerful enough to see back far enough to this point, we couldn't see past it as the universe would have been opaque. At this point in time, the observable universe is about 85 million light years in diameter. I started this video at the point at which neutrinos stop interacting, and I'm finishing this video at the point where photons stop interacting and the cosmic microwave background radiation forms. The photons emitted at this time have become redshifted over the lifetime of the universe as it's expanded and so have grown less energetic. 
This has shifted these photons so that they are most noticeable in the microwave end of the spectrum. In my next video, I'm going to look at how the universe develops from 380,000 years or so until about four and a half billion years ago and the formation of our own solar system. But for now, and until next time, thank you for watching.